Hello and welcome to the My Wool Mitten podcast. My name is Carrie and this is my podcast about the life of an aging farmer, me, on a small sheep farm in the middle of the Mitten, Michigan's Lower Peninsula. Today I want to catch us up about the sheep, the Shetland flock in particular, talk to you about some of my knitting projects, the knit along that we have going on with Curio Stitches, and a few podcasts and other things that I've been enjoying. Also mention um, a revived spinning project. Thank you for being here. I look forward to visiting. I thought that maybe I could sit here for a minute and talk to you about the Shetland sheep and where I feel like we're at with them after having lived with them for a few months now. I'll start out by saying that I'm so, so glad I made the decision to try them. I think it was the right one to make. I love my Coradale still. Still have a couple of U's. I think I've mentioned that. But financially, for the light footprint that they have on the landscape, for the smaller amount that they eat, for the smaller amount of manure in the barn, um, for their thriftiness, I think, and I'm expecting good things in their mothering. I'm really, really pleased. Not to mention how much I love the wool that I've been able to use so far. They impress me very, very much with their grazing. Um, a really good way to manage your pasture is with rotational grazing or strip grazing depending on what you want to call it, but where you fence off a small amount um, which kind of forces your animals to eat in that area before you move them to the next area. And we did practice that. We used the electric net fencing and moved the, the flock of Coradales in a rotation and that worked really well. Um, but a couple of things, my, my net fencing needs to be replaced and it, it was a great thing, lasted a lot longer than even it's predicted to, but that would need to be replaced. Also, I think it was Bill who mentioned it um, as he was requiring more care and I didn't have as much time and energy to spend outside. I, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of pasture or enough pasture, I guess I should say. And he just said, why don't you just let them go and graze where they want to? and save yourself some trouble. And so we did. Um, but <clears throat> that does end up with some problems. I especially noticed it in the drought year that we had this year, not so much in the in a year with a lot of moisture. But with the Corydales and Suffolk, uh, we had, you know, growing up with Suffolk, they will, <laughs> there's little Tamoa, she's so pretty, They'll go out and they'll find a spot of something that they like and they'll stand there and eat and eat and eat until that's eaten right down before they move on to something else. With the Shetlands, they seem to browse. So they might, this is pasture. Hope I'm not wiggling the camera too much. Um, there's pasture back there. And they'll move back and forth. Sorry. They'll move back and forth across that pasture. They don't stand in one place and just eat until it's munched down to nothing. And I don't think that's a fluke. I've observed them doing that since they've been here. And so I really like that. Um, of course, they don't require quite as much feed as the Coradales do. And so I think that financially, profit-wise, this is going to be a better thing. Now we'll see. We'll see if the wool sells for me. There seem to be so many people with Shetlands, and Shetland wool is very available. And so we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But I kind of went for something a little bit of a specialty, I think, with the finer fleece and with the, the black, the true jet black, and the grays. And my one white or cream colored girl, 
who's down the hill there. That's Coriander. Here's Style. And I have had a hard time keeping a coat on her this year, so she's a little bit more sun bleached, but she is black underneath. And I need to order more coats. But anyway, that's kind of a sidetrack. So I'm really pleased, I'm really pleased with handling them. This is a pretty calm bunch, so that makes it kind of nice. So I'm happy about that. Do I miss the thought of having the Corridales? Yes, I miss it very much. Even though I have these couple of girls here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breed them to the Shetland Rams, so that won't be Corridale lambs. But I've had Corridales since I was 12 years old, and we focused on maintaining an old style, an old standard of the breed. And so to not have them now, I guess, I guess I'm mourning them. I'm, I'm grieving the loss of raising them. But it is what it is. And um, yeah, so I do still have those few. So I'll still have a little bit of Coradale fleece left. And then my friend Beth, who has some Coradale still, I can, I can supply you with fleece, Coradale fleece that way if you'd like to. And over the years, I've sure appreciated the enthusiasm that you all have had for the Coradales. So that was my um, podcast anniversary update on the sheep flock and where it is and where I'm at with my decision with the Shetlands. Very happy. It's the 10th of November today and I'm planning to put the rams in closer to the 1st of December. So I'm looking forward to that too, to getting that done. We have been graced with, blessed with some fantastic weather. And even though I'm a cold weather girl, I like the winter and I like the fall, we've had some fantastic weather, which has helped me finish getting some things done. I don't do things as fast as I used to. It takes me a little more time. That's Malala down there. Oh, she's so beautiful. They're all beautiful. And these are the two you lambs, Tamoa and Temperance. Hope I didn't spin the camera too fast. But anyway, the weather has been nice for getting some extra things done. And even though it's warm, like in the 60s, we don't have humidity, so it's nice for working. So there's my, it's not bucket talk, I'm sitting on the ground, but there's my little bit of thoughts about the, the Shetland sheep. And how pleased I am with the decision. Tamoa. Here's my update on my project for the Curio Stitches Knit Along. These are the Jera Harvest Socks from the Casting Ruins collection. And uh, I have spoken about these before, but just as a quick update, this is Farm Yarn Coradale, natural gray, and then an overdyed gray. And one thing I did different about the pattern, the pattern as Ellie has written it, has you putting the, the symbols at the top, at the leg, before you do the cuff. And I wanted to do mine on the toe so I could see them when I was wearing them. So all I've done is just switched it around and done them here on the foot. And I first thought that I might do them on the leg as well, but I don't think I will now. I think I'm just gonna keep working and get them finished up. I'm out here in the woods right now and I'm at Bill's tree that I've talked about often before. This is an oak in the woods that was we always thought of as Bill's tree, my husband's tree. Probably one of the biggest trees in our woods. And uh, it was always a marker. 
you could know where you were at in the woods from here, which look in a direction, see the other trees. And um, Bill often referred to it when he got to the point in his illness that he couldn't come to the woods. When he was speaking about something in the woods, he referred to this point. And so it was a touchstone always. Uh, and although it is a white oak, and we often think of white oak as feminine, the massive size of this oak, and because it was central to our forest, it just seemed as though it should be Bill's tree. And when he was getting poorly, the tree went into decline as well. And I always thought of that as quite a symbol. And even now it continues to go. You can see this big long branch that has come down. There's another one up here that has, and one that's been lost up here. But all that to say, when I was deciding what project to cast on for the Curio Stitches Knit Along and for the rune stones, I had to do a little research about rune stones. I didn't real and ruins. Um, I didn't really know what they were, and I wanted to understand a little bit about what they were about. So it was kind of an interesting history. Some people use them like um, not casting spells, but like knowing a path or being a guidance for you. And um, I didn't really want to do that, although they can be used, I guess, to set intentions. But one thing that I read was that uh, if you didn't have a gift for using the rune stones or reading the signs that they presented, and you did it anyway, that you could actually bring bad luck on yourself. And I certainly didn't want to do that. <laughs> and I don't feel that I have any gift for using them. So I thought, well, I'm not going to do that. But another thing that I read was that it's believed that because they were an ancient um, alphabet or language and the way that they've been found in different locations, that they may have been, it's believed, some things that I read, that they may have been used to mark um, a property or an inheritance, um, or a border and I liked that idea and I thought I couldn't help but think of this tree and that it's a touchstone to us and that we know where we're at when we're in the woods when we're here so that was my thought about how I would use the ruin symbols and also I didn't want to draw a symbol to choose luck for myself I wanted to draw a symbol of my name and so uh, I chose the ones that would kind of symbolize in our modern alphabet the spelling of my name and so I did it top and bottom so that's what I did how are you using your patterns if you're making something from the rune casting collection so I had hoped to be finished by now but you know um, <laughs> we're busy doing life stuff instead of recording stuff or sitting and knitting and I, I am having some trouble with I record from my phone and my camera doesn't seem to want to do a great job of filming so I've gone into settings I can't see where there's anything that has been changed or that needs to change it's all updated so I've got to research that any a little more but I wanted to get something out here for you guys since I had promised something in October and it's now November 10th. So anyway, that's my socks. There's my project bag. And here I am in the woods in the middle of November with a 70 degree day. It's unheard of. This is podcast editor Carrie coming back to say that if you'd like to win a pattern prize from Curio Stitches, it's my turn to draw the prize this week, the weekend of November 19th. So just comment down below, take a look at Ellie's patterns on CurioStitches.com, or if you use Ravelry, uh, Curio Stitches on Ravelry. You don't have to already be knitting a pattern. Just take a look and tell me if there's something that you would like to knit and you will be entered into the prize giveaway, a pattern drawing. Um, this would not include the ebook. This would be only with the single patterns. So I hope you'll think about participating. Ellie has several lovely patterns and um, I think that you would enjoy knitting any of them. 
So leave a comment down below telling me what pattern you would like to make if you were to win the giveaway. And thank you for participating. Before I go, there's a few things that I would like to mention, a few people, um, and a few things that I got in the mail. This bag, isn't the fabric just beautiful? I love it. Absolutely love it. And this is from City Street Textiles. And the person who won one of my prize giveaways last time, and I don't know if she'll want me to say her name, but her business is City Street Textiles. And I'll put a link down below or else on the screen here. And so um, when, she, when I contacted her to see about where to send her pattern prize to, she, um, we were just talking and it turned out that she had had an, a shop that she had to close and then now she has an online shop and she wasn't trying to sell me anything. She just had mentioned it in passing. Well, of course I had to go and take a look and um, you might want to check it out too. If I spun cotton, I would certainly be picking some up, um, but I did see these project bags and I absolutely fell in love with this material. And so I ordered it. And the ship, the price was very reasonable. The shipping was very fast here in the United States. And along with it, she sent me the matching DPN cozy and said um, th that it was to help me keep the squirrels out of my knitting, which I thought was really sweet. And if you saw my podcast where I talked about lost knitting, you'll know that I suspected squirrels had carried it off when I found it near the tree. So anyway, City Street Textiles, and it's just a lovely little project bag, and it's hard to resist going back and getting more. Then I also wanted to mention a couple of podcasts that I enjoy, some new to me and some uh, that I've been a longtime follower of, and some of them with a lot of followers and some with a few, but I wanted to mention them to you because I've been enjoying them. And the first one is Amelia, and she's in Sweden, and her podcast is, let's see if I say this right. She has a tag inside of this bag because I received this lovely project bag from her. Her name is Amelia and Amelia Style is the name of her podcast and she does it in English so you might want to go and check it out. She's a very very prolific knitter and spinner and faces some adversities without um, complaining, just being very matter of fact. And I've enjoyed catching up with her. I thank you to Susan of Wild Cottage Knitting for mentioning Amelia's podcast. I went and followed right away. And then Amelia and I have contacted each other through Instagram because she is a farmer in Sweden. I'm a farmer in the United States. And I'm always interested about what farm life is like in other parts of the world. And so we got to visiting about that. Well, then, lo and behold, she sent me some beautiful, beautiful Angora rabbit fiber from her Angora bunnies, and I have a project in mind with that. But along with that came this stitch or this project bag and some stitch markers and progress keepers, and her daughter makes these. So isn't that wonderful? And I told her, be sure and tell her daughter what a wonderful job she did. This is well lined. Um, the zipper works beautifully. And I think the progress keepers and stitch markers are so cute. I've got some Christmas knitting that these will go on. So that's Amelia, and she's on both Instagram and uh, on YouTube. So I'll put a link to her as well. And then now uh, another friend that I want to mention is Sarah at Fiber Trek. And probably a lot of you, if you're following me, you would follow along with Sarah because she is all about wool and place-based knitting, and if you've ever heard that term, soulful, soulful stash, that phrase came from Sarah, and uh, she lives it, and she inspires us to do the same, and she's enthusiastic about it, and recently she's made some changes to her podcast. She talks a lot about other crafts that she does and other things that she's exploring, all very, very interesting. She started a Patreon, and of course I had to join in to support her, and so um, but you can also see her episodes for free. She she puts them out on YouTube. So if you don't already follow Sarah, go and do it because it, she is so full of inspiration and she's always been a great champion of wool and wool producers, especially small producers. So, uh, And recently, two things uh, from 
from her last episode that really uh, caught my my interest. And one was always being someone who mentions something that I might have missed or might have gone under my radar. She mentioned uh, the new Kate Davies um, club, which you can't sign up for now. It's closed. But I happened to hear about it before it closed, and I signed up, and it's all about color work. So thank you, Sarah, for that rabbit hole to send me down. I truly appreciate it. And it's been a joy already. It's it's only been going a couple of weeks, but it's wonderful. And so that's Sarah at Fiber Trek. And then a lot of you probably know she has a large following, but if you don't, I want to mention Stephanie at Edible Thoughts Makes. And Stephanie has a podcast that's just a treasure. It's just a dream. She does it so well. She makes a beautiful video, um, lovely music, wonderful commentary, and her podcast is knitting, but it's also food and food for thought and um, gardening and just life stuff. And I I enjoy her podcast so, so much. I'm always just thrilled when uh, I get a notification that she has a new episode. She's so considerate to all of her viewers or to anyone watching. She's so enthusiastic. She's so, I don't know, I just can't say enough good things. And yet when she does talk about knitting projects, she gives so much detail. And I appreciate that as well. So if you don't already, go and follow Stephanie, both on YouTube and on Instagram, Edible Thoughts Makes. You won't be disappointed, I'm sure. She does just such a great job. So thank you, Stephanie, for your efforts in doing that. And finally, to close this episode out, I want to um, show you these socks. If you have followed me for any length of time, you'll know that this was my first pair in January of this year, January, February, of my hand-spun, hand-knit sock project and how much fun that was if, was. if you don't know about it, I'll put a link to the first episode and you can go back and start there at the beginning and follow along. I had wanted to make six pairs of hand-spun, hand-knit socks this year and it just hasn't happened, but I've had several questions about it lately and interest in it being revived and I've never really abandoned it. I just haven't had time to finish all the things I started. And I'd been sampling some different fibers Hadn't quite come up with anything that I that I really wanted. And I have two contenders right now, and I'm going to show you those real quick. This is some Coradale, dyed and uh, natural colored, but not quite as smooth as what I would like for socks. I've sampled that. It's a little more bouncy, but not. I don't think I want that for socks. But I think I have found my next fiber for my next pair of socks. And it's this loveliness here. I hope the camera is showing, that it looks like it's showing pretty true. This is Fin Sheep and Alpaca Blend. And it's uh, pretty much pin drafted roving. So it spins quite nicely. I've got to spin a little more and do a sample, but I think this is a very strong contender for my next pair of socks. Isn't it pretty? So that's what I'm thinking, but I've got to spin a little bit more and, and do a little sample and see for sure if that's what it is. I have been wearing my second pair that I made. Um, that was kind of a brown pair. And um, in fact, they're on my feet right now and they're kind of scruffy. But the weather's changing and my boots are coming out and these are going to come out too. One of the people who participated in the stock spin, let's see, what did we call that? Spin for socks, knit along, I think was what it was. I'll put it on the screen here. But she recently finished a pair and she said, hand spun, hand knit socks are like a hug for your feet. Now, isn't that just the most perfect sentiment? <laughs> because that's exactly what they feel like. There's just something different about, I mean, hand knit socks are wonderful, but when they're hand spun, wool hand knit socks. They're even more so. So I'm thinking, this is the middle of November, I'm thinking about doing an official re relaunch of my project, um, maybe after, the, after Christmas, maybe around the first of the year again. What do you guys think? 
I know a few of you have reached out to me about it, but there's so much going on right now. And that's not to say that we can't be spinning and knitting right now, but maybe to get right back in the in the thick of things, maybe we'll start that out again in January. A new year, a new year for socks and my birthday month. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments down below. And let me know as well, have you been um, continuing to spin for socks? I know Mars at Hey Brown Berry just finished a video about her hand-spun, hand-knit socks. So if you haven't already seen that, go check that out. Like I said, I've been doing some spinning, but I just haven't had a lot of time for it. And I haven't had a lot of extra knitting time. Um, Sarah, who I mentioned from Fiber Trek, was talking about all the plans that she had for different knits and the yarns that she already had in stash to complete those projects. But life had been getting in the way and she hadn't been able to do it. And she said they were they were projects that she was knitting in her heart. And I really liked that phrase. So Sarah, here's to projects that we're knitting in our hearts at, to eventually coming onto the needles. We'll keep our, we'll keep the faith that it's gonna happen. So let me know down below if you've been spinning for socks or if you abandoned it, if it didn't work out for you, or if you'd like to start again in January. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Finished just in time for our first mini snowfall. I finished my Jarrah Harvest socks. Um, however, the, the uh, video podcast for this week is pretty much all done. So I'm just gonna insert this quick picture of them and mention that I will give details on them in the next episode. So my first project of the knit along is finished. And these are the Jera Harvest socks. A new shed construction made from recycled materials that I wanted to talk to you about just in time for the first snowfall. But we'll give details on the next episode. Time for Bailey and I to go inside out of the snow.